Okay, so in this class session, we're going to talk about two other revenue sources, grants and debt. Um, now, if you're astute, you've noticed that debt is not actually a revenue source, right? Because you have to pay it back. So it's not revenue because you don't get to keep it. But it is a source of capital for nonprofits. And so that's why we're going to talk about it in context of this class session. Um, and in context of our sort of revenue sources conversation we've been having. Um, from this class session, I want you to know the meaning of open applications, RFPs, and LOIs. Those are terms that relate to the grant um, foundation world. Uh, I want you to be able to explain how leverage works and then explain secured debt, bridge loans, private activity bonds, and lines of credit. Let's talk about the grant economy. Um, now, the reason we're talking about this, because you remember from a prior class session that you know, foundations don't give nearly as much money as private individuals do, but they still give a lot. And the part of the reason we're talking about this is because nonprofits sometimes get the impression that to, they could just fund themselves by writing lots of grant applications. Well, often that's a very naive perspective on it. And um, the truth is that uh, uh, you need to understand the grant economy so you can make better decisions. Uh, how many foundations are there in the United States? There are a little over 76,000. Um, the total amount that they gave through grants back in 2010, that's the most recent information I have, um, was $45.7 billion. So that's a lot of money, right? And it seems like a small nonprofit should be able to get their hands on some of that. Well, this is when it starts to get complicated because when you look at the total amount given by just the top 25 funders, and this isn't the top 25% of funders, this isn't the top 25,000 funders, this is just you count the 25 biggest giving foundations in the United States, how much did they give away out of that 45 billion? And the answer is 10.7 billion. Well, if you do the math, you'll notice that this is about a quarter of all giving um, by foundations. So 25 foundations are giving about a quarter of the total money given away every year. That's amazing. It's a huge concentration of grant making power with just 25 foundations. Now that should, you should recognize that that already diminishes your opportunities as a small nonprofit seeking grants. Now it's going to get worse because the total value of gifts that are greater than $5 million, meaning of the $45 billion, how much is given away in chunks of $5 million or more? And the answer to that is about half. So if you're a small nonprofit that can't justify a $5 million grant, then half of the grant money given away every year is off the table to you. So before that $45 billion number looked really enticing, right? There's a lot of money for a nonprofit to go get. Well, the reality is, is no, if you can't justify a $5 million grant, then only half of that money is actually on the table for you, and even not all of it, what remains. And because foundations have different grant making priorities, and they have different processes, and so the reality is the amount of grant making money available to your nonprofit shrinks and shrinks, depending on who you are. Um, it's interesting to look at the assets of foundations over time, and this is inflation adjusted. So um, the bottom line, sorry, is inflation adjusted. And what you can see is that, you know, foundations were doing okay in 2000, right? But we had a bubble heating up then. So in two, by 2002, foundation assets had dropped about a quarter. Um, over, you know, a roughly six-year period, it climbed. But then we had another market crash, and it dropped down to pre-2000 levels. Um, and then it's just gradually climbed its way back up. So in real dollars, and don't get distracted by the blue line because, you know, current nominal dollars don't count. If you look in real dollars, foundations have not really grown asset-wise. So, they, so they're not really growing as a category of the nonprofit sector, at least not over the last decade. Now, you remember I pointed you to the huge concentration of giving. Um, well, it comes with a huge concentration of wealth, right? And so if you look at, um, you know, this is, these are, this, this is old information. It's from 2004. And unfortunately, the Foundation Center hasn't updated this with a new version. But the numbers are probably still almost identical. Um, on the left, this is kind of a confusing chart. But on the left, you can see the number of foundations, and then they're color-coded by asset size. So the light gray lightest gray color means 64% of the foundations have less than a million dollars in total assets. And 2% of the foundations have more than $50 million in assets. So as, a, as the number of foundations go, you can see the vast majority of them have less than a million, which means they can't give away very much every year without running out of money. 
Um, now go to the second column there and you can see there are the assets. And so now rather than comparing foundations by, by the number of foundations, we're just comparing them by assets. And what you can see is that 50 million, so that foundations that have $50 million or more, they control 69% of the assets. Now, if you put the two charts together, what it tells you is that 2% of foundations in the United States own 69% of the assets. So, you know, in, uh, in, you know, in the United States over the last few years, we kept talking about the one percenters. Well, in the foundation space, we have two percenters meaning we have a very, very small number of foundations that own the vast majority of foundation assets. And this is part of the reason that giving is so concentrated in large chunks, right? Because if you're the Gates Foundation, you have to give away hundreds of millions of dollars every year, which they do. You're going to want to give it away in big chunks, not little chunks. Little chunks are more expensive. They require more staff time relative to each dollar that you give away. If you can give your money away in $5 million chunks or more, then it, it means less staff and easier work to get the money out the door. So we'll talk together about the implications of all this in class. Um, finally, it's interesting to look at the geographic distribution over time. In 1975, um, foundations were concentrated mostly in Texas, California, in the Northeast, um, a little bit in the Midwest, but not really. Um, and as you can see over time, as the number of foundations has grown, so has its geographic distribution. And so there have been more and more foundations growing in places like Utah, for example, or Colorado. Washington State got on the map, which it hadn't before. A lot of that was driven by rich um, Microsofties. But anyway, um, you can see that uh, the number of foundations has been growing and spreading geographically. OK. Um, together in class, we're going to have a conversation about the proper role of philanthropy. There's a guy, a conservative commentator in the nonprofit sector named Bill Chambra, who I like to reference at this point in the semester because he has some really compelling arguments to make that foundations, as they become increasingly technocratic, are actually taking away or weakening democracy in a really fascinating way. And we're going to talk about that together in class, but I'll save the discussion for then. <clears throat> okay, so some realities when you're applying for grant money. First of all, knowing someone at the foundation dramatically increases the likelihood of receiving a grant. So you need to go network. You need to find your way to places and to people. And be warned, foundation staff kind of build up a reputation of being closed off because they kind of get sick of being approached. So your best strategy when trying to reach a foundation is to find somebody who knows somebody who works at the organization. So get an intermediary or an advocate, someone who's trusted, who can bring you to the attention of the foundation staff. Um, they really, without these networks, you're going to have a much harder time getting money. Secondly, venture philanthropy is a new funding trend. Well, I mean, it's a decade old. And the idea is putting pressure on nonprofits to use impact assessment tools and set measurable goals. Venture philanthropists are insisting on having like board seats on the, on the nonprofits that they fund. It's a much more involved, energized version of funding. So if you're interested in getting some venture philanthropy money, just be ready for an exciting ride because they will be very demanding. And finally, the grant writing process has a lot of particularities depending on the funder. Uh, every funder has rules on their website or some other place where they explain what they look for in a grant application. And some of it is sort of broad general stuff, like this is the category of activity we're funding, right, or the geographic area we're interested in. But a lot of the particularities matter too, like they give you page counts, they give you margins, they give you font size, they, they uh, give you a form that they want you to fill out instead of sending them an unsolicited grant application. If you're not following the rules when you apply for a grant, it is the quickest way for a foundation to filter you out because it's a really easy decision for them. They view their nonprofits as partners. And if you are not following basic rules like the formatting of the document you send in, then they know that you're not going to be a trustworthy partner and they will file your application away permanently in the garbage. And so make sure that you take the time to follow all the rules. Some nonprofits will hire a grant writer who will basically churn out maybe 40 applications, right? And they're all largely the same, maybe slightly altered and send them out the door to 40 different foundations. It's sort of the shotgun approach to funding. The problem with the shotgun approach is it ignores those particular details and you end up losing. Um, you just wasted a bunch of time because none of the foundations are interested in you if you won't follow their rules. Okay. Um, 
Grant makers use different methods for receiving proposals. One is just having an open application process, usually a standing invitation to submit proposals. Sometimes that's restricted by calendars, so they might say, for example, we review any proposals that come in once a quarter, right? Um, and so you'd have to be attentive to those application deadlines. But the point is they accept applications from anyone. Some foundations, uh, especially the big ones, use RFPs, or requests for proposal. Um, that's, this, is they, this is when they solicit proposals for particular purposes. The Gates Foundation does this almost exclusively. Um, and so what they will do is say, we want to fund a malaria vaccine. And this has to be the conditions of the malaria vaccine. Or a more famous one lately is improved condoms or improved toilets. And so Gates has, has said, we want to fund this kind of activity. And so they put out this request for proposals. And they won't consider any grant application that doesn't fit the RFP requirements. Finally, some foundations don't like getting big stacks of um, un, of grant proposals that they'll never read, and so what they do is they they simplify it into what's called a letter of inquiry, and this is where they they invite letters sent to the foundation to examine the interest in a particular proposal idea. So rather than writing a full-on grant application, what they want is to is for you to send a one-page letter. And then they'll read the letter and decide, yeah, this is something we might be interested in. Then they'll reach out to you and say, now submit us a grant application, and then you can submit your application. Um, but uh, they won't take full-on grant applications without an LOI that's been approved first. OK, so that's it as far as grants are concerned. Let's talk about debt. Just some basics as we talk about debt. Why borrow? Well, the reason why would a nonprofit want to borrow is the important point. Um, well, the reality is nonprofits borrow for all the same reasons other companies and people do. They do it to smooth their cash flow, right? Um, some com companies are constantly borrowing money to pay payroll, um, and that might be a reason the nonprofit borrows money. Um, they might borrow money for capital purchases like trucks or buildings, right? So a, a nonprofit will take out a mortgage. Um, we're going to talk about uh, the importance of debt for capital purchases for nonprofits in um, class. Um, and then finally, an important point to borrow for nonprofits is leverage. And I want to illustrate the concept of leverage really quickly. So when you, um, let's pretend you have $1,000 and you can borrow money at a 4% interest rate and you have an investment opportunity that's going to return 6%. So you've got this 1000 bucks, and if you invest the $1,000 directly, meaning you're investing only your equity, then you're going to get $60 back, right? That's that's how that would work. Um, but you could take your $1,000 to prove yourself as being credit worthy and borrow money. And this is where we take your equity and we leverage it, right? So you take your down payment of $1,000, you borrow $9,000, and that gives you $10,000 now to invest. Well, um, if you invest that $10,000, you're going to get $600 as a return instead of $60 when you're just investing your own money. The problem is you have to pay the money back, right? And so you're going to have to pay back $9,000 times the interest rate, which was 4%. So you're going to owe an, a, an additional $360 in interest. So what we're going to do now is it, it, the difference here is your profit. And so you're going to get a $600 gain off of your investment, you have to pay the $9,000 plus the $360 in interest back, well, your net profit is still $240 because you used debt to, in, to invest. Now, um, this, is how, this is the basic concept of how leverage works in a for-profit world. Uh, the question is, does it work in a nonprofit world? Uh, and I want you to consider this. Um, let's say you go to a fundraiser. This is based on a true story. Let's say you go to a fundraiser. And at the fundraiser, this nonprofit is bragging about the new building that they just built. And not only are they bragging about the new building, but they're bragging about the fact that over a 20-year period, they raised the money to pay cash for the building. So they paid cash to, to, for the construction of this building. Um, I want you to decide if you think they're a smart nonprofit to donate to. Because we're going to talk about that idea in class. And I'm going to tell you why I think you should not donate to that nonprofit. OK, so we'll hold on to that little mystery. Um, if we're going to have a conversation about debt, we have to talk about bankruptcy. Um, nonprofits declare bankruptcy all the time, just like for-profit companies and individuals do. 
Um, bankruptcy is scary. It's emotionally disturbing. It's frustrating, but it's also really important to the health of our economy that we have avenues for bankruptcy. Um, but we also have laws surrounding bankruptcy, and I want to highlight just a couple points. Um, first of all, when you have to go into bankruptcy, make sure you disclose all of your assets to the bankruptcy trustee. This is the person who sort of takes charge of everything you own while you're in bankruptcy. And if you don't disclose all of your assets, then it can get you in big trouble. Now, why would a nonprofit want to hide assets? Well, for example, they might say, you know what, we're going to set aside this $5,000 because we promised it to, you know, uh, we promised it to our staff. Well, if you, if you hide money, then you can actually lose your bankruptcy protection and everything is worse off. Um, make sure that you don't go crazy right before declaring bankruptcy. Bankruptcy trustees can be empowered by the court to go backwards in time to undo transactions. So I gave the example of setting aside $5,000 so you can pay your employees. Well, you might think, you know what we'll do? We've got a bunch of cash right now. Even though we're deep in debt, we've got some cash in our bank account. We'll pay all of our employees today earlier than normal, and then tomorrow we'll declare bankruptcy. Well, if you do that, then the bankruptcy trustee can actually go back and revoke the salaries that you paid. Um, and they can do that backwards up to a certain time period, depending on the nature of the bankruptcy. Um, just always remember bankruptcy is better than prison. Um, don't lie or cheat or steal to avoid the consequences of bankruptcy, because if you do, you can get in big trouble. Some other debt concepts. Um, you may hear these terms recourse and non-recourse debt. Um, this determines whether or not the borrower is personally liable for a debt. Um, a recourse debt means the borrower, the lender has recourse against the borrower, meaning they can go after the borrower's personal assets. Um, there, uh, some nonprofits in, get signed up for leases for buildings, for example, like you might sign a 10-year lease for a building. A lease is an obligation that's just like debt. Um, uh, and so if you sign a lease, you're basically in debt for the term of the lease. Some of you who have had apartment contracts know how this works. Uh, contracts you wanted to get out of early, for example. And finally, um, there's such a thing as debt relief income, which means when a debt is forgiven, it counts as income for your for to you for tax reasons. So when somebody lends you money, it's not income you have to count. But when somebody lends you money and then says, hey, never mind, um, then the amount of money that they say, hey, never mind to, that becomes income to you. Now, for most nonprofits, that won't matter, right, because their income is tax-free. Unless you are engaged in unrelated business income um, activities, in which case it would be income to you. So you have to understand that concept of debt relief income. When somebody forgives you a debt, it counts as income to you as far as taxes go. How do nonprofits borrow money? Here are four prominent ways that they do it. Um, one is through something so called secured debt. This is where you take debt and collateralize it, meaning that the lender can take something specific away if you don't pay. Uh, a mortgage on a building is is a secured debt. Um, a, a car loan where the where the bank keeps the title to the car is a secured debt. Um, you can actually do secured debt for all kinds of things, inc including current and future collateral. So you can take out a secured loan on your inventory. Well, your inventory should be turning over really frequently, right? Well, the smart attorney who writes this debt agreement is going to say that it secures that that the loan is secured by all current and future inventory, meaning if they ever have to come and, and repossess anything, the current inventory is what they get, um, it, you know, in, into the future whenever they have to um, uh, call in the loan. Um, you have to, to have secure debt, you have to fill out a security agreement and file it with the state. We'll talk about why that's the case in class. The basic idea is that it keeps people from borrowing money against the same asset over and over again. And, p and nonprofits use it for equipment purchases, capital improvements, buildings, all kinds of things. Okay. Um, bridge loans are another form of financing. These are usually more expensive, although they are short term. So um, this is just so you can overcome a temporary cash shortfall. Um, like I said, they usually come with a higher rate of interest. And banks usually only give bridge loans if there's a clear repayment source. So if, for example, you have a big fundraiser every May um, and you need to borrow money in April, you could bring the records of this fundraiser and say, look, over 10 years we brought in this much every year, then the bank might be willing to give you a bridge loan based on the reliability of that um, fundraiser. OK. 
Okay, private activity bonds are interesting because they are debt, but it's not debt that the nonprofit has to repay. It's debt that a city has to repay. So this is a municipal bond that's issued to raise ca capital for a private entity. Um, 501c3 organizations qualify to receive the money as long as they're using it for a public purpose. And so, for example, if a city wants a health clinic in their community, but they don't want to run it, they can bring a nonprofit hospital in and say, hey, we'll raise the money to build this building, and then we'll give the building to you. Um, and then the city will pay back the debt on the building over time. Um, the the bond that was issued for the building. Um, this is actually really cool. It's also neat because investors' income from the bond is tax-free. So this is actually how Mitt Romney makes a bunch of his money, is by investing in municipal bonds that are tax-free. Um, all right, and then finally there's a line of credit. And the way a line of credit works is it's sort of like a credit card. It's a standing account that you can call on as needed. Interest is obviously only ever due on the amount borrowed from the line. So if you have a $100,000 credit line and you borrowed 50 grand, you're gonna owe interest on the 50 grand and it's calculated on a daily basis usually. Generally, lines of credit carry a retirement phase and they have to be paid off before renewed. They also call this a sunset, basically, it usually is an annual thing where the line of credit has to be fully repaid by the end of a year and then it can be restarted after that after you've repaid it in full and the reason banks do this is because they don't like the idea of hanging a big debt out there forever because you don't actually with the line of credit unlike credit cards where you have to make minimum payments with the line of credit you often don't even have to make minimum payments you just pay on the interest until the sunset phase shows up and you have to pay back the balance in full so that's the line of credit. Um, some questions that we will discuss in class. Businesses can turn to equity or debt for capital, meaning I can sell shares or I can borrow money to run my business. Nonprofits can't sell equity to raise capital. Is this really fair? I mean, that means nonprofits either have to get people to give them money, they have to, or they, or to to grow their capital, or they have to um, uh, borrow money, but they can't sell shares, which uh, is unique to businesses. Um, and then we're going to talk about whether or not interest charges reduce the value of donations. Um, there are people who say that nonprofits shouldn't borrow money because that means donor dollars are being used to pay interest to banks. Um, let's talk about that concept in class because I would argue, based especially based on the concept of leverage, that uh, it's actually a good idea for nonprofits to borrow money given the right circumstance. And that means donor dollars can actually be really well spent even if that don those donor dollars are going just to pay um, interest to a bank. All right, that's it. I look forward to seeing you guys in class.